The good news is this show and tell is something that you can see better from up here, too. What is this thing I've got in my hand? This is not a trick question. A name tag. A name tag. Correct. That was just to identify that for the people back there who can't see it. Um, and we have name tags here, and a lot of the folks out in the pews are wearing them, and some of them aren't, and I'm not doing this to make anybody feel guilty for not wearing their name tag. Um, but one of the reasons that we have name tags here is as an act of hospitality. Hospitality is how we help people who are new feel more comfortable when they get here. So a couple of you are actually pretty new here, right? And it's kind of hard, isn't it, when you walk into a new room full of people you don't know, right? I feel kind of shy when I walk into a new room full of people I don't know. But if they are wearing name tags, then at least I know who is normally there, and I know that I can call somebody by their name if I need something, if I've got a question about like where the bathroom is or how do I get another donut, right? Um, then I know I can ask somebody with a name tag and they might know. And that's one of the reasons that we do this. And I try to make sure that I call people by their names, by their correct names that they want me to call them. And I do that for a reason, partly so that they can feel welcome and included, but part of the reason that I do that is because I think that God knows our names too. And so when we use the right names for other people, we are helping them know that God loves them. So that's one of the reasons that I do this. Um, and I know that sometimes God knows us by names that we don't even know yet right? Sometimes we have great Bible stories. This isn't one of them, but we've got great Bible stories about God changing somebody's name. And so sometimes somebody will tell me, hey, you used to call me this name, but now call me this name instead. And I try to do that too, because I believe that God knows us and loves us that way. Um, so that takes some work sometimes, right? It can be hard to learn a whole room full of new names, right? We've been there, we've done that. Even the people who know everybody in this room have had a hard time learning new names in the past and had to learn all these names one at a time. We've got a Bible story today that is about somebody's name. It is about somebody hearing their name. And when they hear their name, they realize the great big good news of Easter. Now, you remember what the good news of Easter is, right? What's the good news of Easter? Jesus sacrificed. Jesus sacrificed himself and died, and then on Easter he came back alive. He came back alive. Is that amazing or what? So, listen as we listen to this Bible story together and read this Bible story together if you are a reader and want to read out loud uh, while everybody else is reading out loud too. Notice how somebody's name helps them realize that Jesus is alive. Are you ready? Can I sit right up there with you? Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the New Testament, John 20, 11 to 18. And if you'd like to join me and read this collectively, you're more than welcome. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, 
and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that she said things to her. The Word of God. We are ordaining and installing elders uh, later on in today's service as um, uh, two new folks and one uh, continuing folk uh, joins our session, uh, which turns over at this time of year. Uh, the new elders who are entering the session particularly are, are entering into a conversation that's already in progress. And so... Uh, they have to spend a little time catching up. Um, and uh, this year, the conversation that they're entering includes a set of questions that was asked to us by one of our presbytery executives. Uh, these three questions, you don't have to memorize these questions. Um, but the first question, when have you felt close to God? When have you felt close to God? And then the second question, when have you felt far away from God? And then the third question, what is something God has done in your life? Those are some challenging questions for Presbyterians and I think a lot of other mainline Christians because we are socialized not to talk about our religious experience. We are taught from an early age that this is not something that we talk about in public or groups of people or, you know, polite company. Um, and honestly, we may feel uncertain about how we would answer these questions, even if it were something we could talk about. We may be uncertain about what it is we've felt or seen, but certainly the topic feels really intimate. It is genuinely a really intimate question. Where have you been close to God? Where have you felt far from God? What has God done in your life? Those are intimate questions. And so we learn culturally to keep personal things private. Our culture is wrong about that, but we are taught to keep personal things private. But these are powerful questions. These are powerful questions for a group that is ordained, set aside, to discern God's will for the church. That's what we ask the elders to do, and these are big questions for that. These are questions that attune us to God's presence and activity in the world. These are questions that teach us that even when God seems to be absent, we still have to pay attention for what God may yet be doing. Paying attention to where we notice God or where we don't notice God, that helps us to discern what God is currently doing and what God is about to do. We think of elders as leaders in the church. And within the church, I suppose they are leaders. But their real role is not to lead. Their real role is to follow. To follow God and to notice where God calls us, and then by following, to help all the rest of us follow as well. The scripture reading that we read together this morning, it introduces us to the first person after Jesus' resurrection who actually sees with her own eyes what God is up to. 
She's the first follower who is able to lead the others into this experience of the risen Christ. Mary Magdalene runs and announces to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Now, elders, later I'm going to tell you to go tell that same good news as you have seen it. But first, just soak up Mary's experience. There she is at the empty tomb, the empty tomb, which is such a strange thing. It is still the very first Easter morning. Mary has gotten up before dawn, and she's gone to find the tomb empty. And she went back and she told Peter and the beloved disciple, and they went and saw that the tomb was empty, and somehow they came to believe in that moment, and Mary is still there at the tomb weeping. It is okay for us to come to faith at different times and in different ways. It is okay for us to see someone's experience or hear about someone's experience and still find ourselves standing there weeping and wondering. If we're not there yet, that's still okay. Mary has reason to weep. She has faced some really deeply traumatic events just head on this week. She has stood there in front of the cross alongside Jesus' mother as Jesus died. She made her way to the tomb after the Sabbath to go mourn over Jesus' body, this physical connection to her dead loved one. Only when she got there, she was shocked to find that the body was gone. That was all last week's story. We know that story. She's the one who prepared the others to find an empty tomb, but nobody prepared her to find an empty tomb. No one prepared her to see angels inside the tomb either. And now she's standing there weeping in that gap between what is and what she thought would be. She's stuck there in that gap between what can't possibly be and what is obviously happening right in front of her. And she's stuck there until the person that she thought was the gardener spoke her name. She's stuck there until that gardener speaks her name. Mary recognizes Jesus because she recognizes her own name in his voice. She recognizes Jesus because he hands her identity back to her. That voice calling Mary's name, it's like this echo from a future that has not yet quite come into being. It's an an echo from this resurrected world that began with Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus tells Mary that his resurrection is renewing our relationship as children of God. And then he sends her to tell that same good news to others. She goes and says, I have seen the Lord and he has called me back into being. Jesus has to call me back into being over and over again. Over and over again as the the stresses of work and family and life just distract me from who I really ultimately am. You call my work church, but I assure you it is still work, even if you are paid to be here. We all know that even the good stuff is stressful. We all know that the the meetings and the programs and the home repairs and the school events and even the celebrations, they can all distract us from who we really ultimately are in God's presence. Well, it was around one of those times that a preschooler, let's call him Wyatt, uh, started coming to a, our most word-heavy worship service. This was not at this, uh, this congregation, but Wyatt started coming to this really profoundly word-heavy uh, worship service. It was intimate, it was interactive, but it was a lot of talking. And most kids would just check out at that time of day for that kind of service, but Wyatt listened, and he colored, and he read, but he listened, and he would respond from time to time with input as we uh, discussed the scriptures together, but he was always present there. And then one evening, after worship, Wyatt said, hey, I'd like to be baptized. 
Wyatt's family moved around uh, pretty frequently, and so he just hadn't been baptized as an infant. Well, as a preschooler, he was still too young to make the promises on his own behalf. And so we asked his parents to make the promises for him, but he was old enough to be aware and understand what was going on in that baptism. And so uh, I always have sort of a prep conversation with parents before a baptism to uh, make sure that they understand roughly what it is that we'll be doing uh, during that uh, ritual, that sacrament. And so I kind of tweaked that conversation and had that conversation with Wyatt while his parents listened in. And he had such good questions. And he could describe with such clarity what it is he was looking for. He could describe with such clarity what it is he understood to be happening during that sacrament. And he helped me reconnect my own faith with his level of understanding. He handed me back to myself as a teacher and as a pastor and as a beloved child of God because he could tell me all of those things. So I received that gift again and again, myself handed back to me in somebody else's voice. I receive it again and again because I need it again and again. Jesus calls my name and gives me back to myself. Jesus calls us and invites us to share who we are and who those around us are with each other. So elders, you will be sent to proclaim that good news. You will be sent to share the good news that is present for us, those places where you have seen the Lord, where you have experienced Jesus' presence, whether in private or out there in the world that we share together, you'll be invited to share where you long for the presence of Christ that you haven't quite seen yet, but you know where it ought to be. And through those experiences, we listen and we discern the places where we hear Jesus' voice calling our names And we lead this church and this world in following the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.